All right, so we're going to look at modern philosophy part one. So what sets us different from the modern classical philosophy is these people are probably people you heard more about in the contemporary period, like Kant or Hegel. So we're not just going to focus on Descartes and Locke and the more of what I call the classical modern philosophers, but more on the modern philosophy of more recent times. Not exactly contemporary philosophy per se, but more of the 19th century and those kind of people. So the most major thing movement in the modern philosophy is of course the romantic movement. What the romantic movement was was that it began to focus on human feelings and emotions. So that's the summary. So the background was that in the 19th century people began to feel oppressed because of society. If you look around society now you'll notice that there's not a lot of action or drills or life risking unless you go to the military, right? So people felt that in the 19th century. There's too much science, too much certainty. So they began to look at stuff that they didn't know, something that would be capricious, something that would change and rapid and still provide some kind of drill for them. And the answer for them was human emotions. Until then, realism, what we perceived, what we saw provide the very basic, most, most structures of society. But in the romantic movement, people felt that they had to focus on something more as a human being, as more expressive. And they began to focus on personalities and emotions and those kind of stuff and those provide the background. Now the most major figure of the romantic movement has to be John de Quas Rousseau. There's lots of debate whether he's actually a philosopher or he's just a romantic movement but for the sake of this purpose we'll consider him as a philosopher. So he is considered the father of the romantic movement although the romantic movement began before him he's still considered the most major figure because he provided the most shape to the romantic figure. His major books are Confessions, Emily, The Social Contract. None of those provided a too much fundamental backing for philosophy, except for social, social and political philosophy in The Social Contract. But his major idea was basically that everything has to be based on feeling. So until then, if you look at Aquinas or if you look at Locke or Descartes, everybody who believed in God wanted to provide a reasonable basis, reasonable belief for that kind of things. People just didn't say, I believe in God because I feel like it. They said, I believe in God because of these, 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 and these reasons. But Rousseau changed all that. In his period, in his book, he began to say that I believe God exists because I have a feeling that God exists. And that feeling has to come from somewhere. So it's like a knockoff version of Descartes more reasonable proof that actually counts as a proof. So most people don't see that as a proof because it's not actually a proof plus there's too many contradictions but this began to have a hold in religion especially Christianity and people began to say well I believe in Christianity because I feel that way. <laughs> so he was the key figure who made human emotions the center of everything without real justification. Also his idea of society was interesting. He argued that Every society was made out of, it has to be an absolute democracy. But what he meant by democracy was far from laws or anyone's definition. He meant democracy as in general will. Now, to be a little specific, what he meant by general will is that he argued that everybody had two wills. One for the personal will, personal good, and other for the public good. And he argued that when personal good will is clashes against each other in society because same people can't get two things, those two cancel each other out. But because there's a public good, what we should do is focus on the public good and we should enforce it as much as possible. So it's not even a majority rule or minority rule, but it's more of a unique subjective rule by an authoritarian government who has to enforce what our society is. So even though it is an absolute democracy, it's not really reflecting the will of the people and that they're persons of society, but the, the will of the society and that society carries the people. It's not very fundamental. It is one of the big three, Locke. Hobbes and Rousseau, but his ideas are mostly misrepresented by other people. So Kant was per arguably the greatest philosopher of the Romantic period. He focused on metaphysics, epistemology, morality, everything. Kant is considered the authority on the more modern part of modern philosophy. So let's cover metaphysics first. So he argued that there were, um, which called? metaphysics had to do with time and space. Everything had to exist in some kind of time space. It's impossible to imagine outside of that. But time and space were subjective to one's own inner needs. So what he meant was that if you look at the second part, you talk, you see a priori empirical and analytic synthetic. He argued that those are the ways that knowledge is gained and therefore those consist of knowledge. A priori knowledge is knowledge that we know from birth without even being anything and empirical knowledge is knowledge that we gain from experience and he argued that analytic statements are statements that we argue to find the meaning of we'll cover that later in Wittgenstein maybe but synthetic statements we provide a new one for example if we say all bachelors are unmarried this would be an analytic statement because the definition of bachelors are unmarried but if we argue let's say one plus one equals two that'll be a synthetic statement because 
synthetic because 1 plus 1 does not imply 2 or 2 imply 1 plus 1. We know it's true, but it's completely new knowledge that cannot exist before. He argued that knowledge were ordered that way and we can get knowledge from that. But he, from to response to Hume, who argued that we had a system of cause and effect, and we just use constant conjunction to look at. He argued that there were certain laws of people that are a priori that we order knowledge from. He didn't exactly explain why, how not some knowledge ordered what, but he argued that, for example, if th we hear thunder and we see lightning, what we see is that there's no necessary connection between thunder and lightning, or we don't see anything in time and space. We just see it, it being ordered, and then we perceive that this is this is how it works, and that's how it works. It's a very complicated doctrine, and his major idea was that people still have both have a priori and empirical ideas that they need to unite. So we have a system inside of us that's a priori that gets the knowledge which is empirical and then we order it in a certain way. It doesn't explain why exactly that happens but this is seen as mostly as a response to Hume. And his idea of existence of God, he denied all the proofs that we put before. The Leibniz's labeling was from Kant, as I mentioned before. The theological proof, those kind of stuff, Kant rejected everything and he argued that God must exist because of morality. We'll cover that in the next slide. So Kant's morality is perhaps the thing that people focus the most on. He had an entirely new different idea of morality. So instead of saying that things were good because they provide the best benefit or happiness to people. He argued that things were good because they were good in themselves. He called them a categorical comparative, and he said that basically it does this. If something is moral, it could be made in a general law, then it must be a moral law that everyone must keep, no matter what the circumstances. So if you make a moral law that says you cannot lie, and then a Marx murder comes to your house and you're hiding a friend and the actual murderer asks where your friend is, you cannot lie. Kant said that it's okay if you make deceiving statements because in that case, no harm will fall to the society if everyone tries to do it and make it a general law because what people will do is that they'll just get sharper, but lying under any circumstances are definitely not possible. So he called those goods goods in themselves, as in they're not extrinsic, they're just intrinsic. And for the proof of God, he argued that God must absolutely exist because morality exists in society. If there is good or bad, yet what society must do that it must have a certain kind of karma system where good people are rewarded and bad people are punished. But since that doesn't happen, Kant argued that there has to be an afterlife when people get ordered to what they what they exactly earned in real life. This kind of this support isn't really supported unless you follow Kant's philosophy, but it does work in the fact that he acknowledges if you acknowledge good and evil then you must agree that there's some kind of power that ordains society. Kant's idea as you can see the main theme was justice and, not, and much else. And nothing much else. Although he did focus on some metaphysics. 